All right. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get into it because okay. I got to work today. We got to work? Scott, mm-hmm. I've been on vacation for the last week. I don't feel like working. I should. I've not been on vacation. I got I got stuffs to do. But New products I to did. Launch. Nice. I made it through all my emails. All 1,500 <laughs> of them. So normally on vacation, I'll be honest, normally on vacation, I still check my email. Because frankly, I don't like coming back to 1,500 unread emails. It's easier to kind of sort through them as they come in, just spend 15 or 20 minutes a day um, sorting through them. But I went on a cruise. I refused to pay for internet on a cruise or international roaming on my cell phone. So I did not look at email. And then I got home and I wished I would have looked at my email. In a way, it was nice to not deal with it. How big of a, I guess, kind of pre-filtered email management person are you? And and I guess for context, uh, yep. I've been going through, we, we've been working on kind of new onboarding documentation as we hire new folks on the team. And one of the things that happens, I think in general, like as a Microsoft person who works with customers, but then being on the, like the product side as well, you get a ton of email that may or may not apply to you. So you really do need to kind of apply a little bit of a lens to it. So on day one, we spend time with folks and we walk them through things like configuring email lists. We provide them a specific set of DLs like, hey, you might want to send these distros to a subfolder and triage them you know, every other day, once a week, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm a big fan yep. of the Scott Hanselman having two inboxes. So an inbox and an inbox CC. Uh, so I can kind of manage things that way. I'm wondering if you do anything similar. I do. And that actually made a big difference. So my 1500 emails were across two different email accounts, but I sort into multiple folders. So, and I do it a combination of ways. I have a third-party product that actually was a sponsor of the show, I think, a while back, SaneBox. Um, And SaneBox uses some intelligence to sort my email. So my email comes in. I have my primary inbox that I do use the focused inbox as well as the other. I have an actual Outlook rule that puts anything that I'm CC'd on into a CC folder for the same reason. I figure if I'm CC'd on it, it's an FYI. It's not something I need to act on right away. Yep. Um, and then SaneBox has some additional things to sort uh, emails that are related to bills. I have a finance folder. Bills, credit card stuff, all of that goes into a finance folder. And then they have like this automatic same later and same news folders where like all the newsletters go into the news ones and it does a pretty good job. And then same later is like not stuff I was CC'd on, but stuff that came to my inbox, but tends to be still not necessarily news focused, but unimportant emails, um, whether there's a bunch of people on it, all that type of stuff. Um, I do get some emails from Microsoft as part of the MVP program that, that's also some distribution lists. All of those emails go to a different folder so I can sit down when I have time and sort through all of those. Um, and then I have a couple rules on my personal email uh, just to sort. So those 1,500 emails were sorted across like eight or nine-ish different folders. Um, so it, it made it a lot easier to just churn through all of them. Like most of the same later and same news stuff I skimmed it and just archived it all, deleted it all. Um, skimmed CC, skimmed the personal email, uh, really only paid attention to my inbox, which truth be told only was like 100, maybe 150 of those actual 1,500 emails. 
Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one. I think lots of people miss it. Like we all deal with email and I, I, I'm i always interested in the way others do it. Um, I, I really, like I said, I'm a big fan of that inbox CC thing. Uh, if you trolled around on Scott Hansman's site, he has another kind of set of tips where you split up uh, you know, emails from externals, emails from internals, things like that. Like that was a little too much for me. Uh, but the CC one and some decent kind of, uh, I, I, th I think like regular scheduled grooming to go through it, uh, has, has been a good way generally to, to do it. And then you can set that expectation with people too. I know like, you know, not everybody follows the same email etiquette that's out there. <laughs> uh, so like you mentioned, Hey, if I'm on the CC, it might not be important to me. Um, you know, I, I live by that one, but not everybody else does. So sometimes I <laughs> meet with people and have to ask them like, is, they go, did you do that yet? No, I haven't even seen that yet. Oh, well, I emailed it to you just now. I'm like, uh, 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 where? <laughs> it's not in my inbox. Well, I CC'd you. Yes. Oh, so it's not important <laughs> for me. Well, what do you mean? No, I emailed you. Like, no, oh, I, I got it. Um, the, the, the other one that we have to do, uh, you know, folks are considering like onboarding guidance in the uh, Outlook, Microsoft 365, Office 365 space is uh, as a remote employee, like I really appreciate this one, is that Outlook capability to end <coughs> meetings early or start them late. But it needs to be configured manually by the person on their mailbox like when they pop in. So it's a little bit weird when we get a new employee in and, and all of a sudden, you know, 25 minute slots start going out as 30 minute uh, blocks or like full hours. And you're like, I can't get up from my desk and do anything. It actually is nice to have just the uh, the, the, the built in break there and you can catch it on either side usually like no matter what's going on. So um, you're never at your desk more than like 50 minutes, which is good. Yes, I have those built into. I think mine all end five minutes early. Um, I would say the trick with that is to actually end five minutes early. So the meeting is <laughs> still is scheduled and it gives you that prompt and it's like, your meeting is ending in five minutes. And you're like, oh, but it's 5-2 or it's 10-2 and my next meeting doesn't start till the top of the hour. So I can really go that extra five minutes. Like, you still have to be dedicated to actually quit five minutes early then because we have been so <laughs> trained to go to the even hour or the even half hour yeah yeah very, very true you still gotta train the human behavior out all right uh now that we got our onboarding tips out of the way for the week what do you want to get into next um so one that i just saw this was not on the ones i sent you scott but thanks <laughs> we are both <laughs> keep me apple on my toes. people yeah keep you on your toes we're both apple people um and uh, if you are an Apple person, Apple announced a whole bunch of stuff this last week while I was gone on vacation around new versions of iOS, macOS, all of that. Uh, don't upgrade to them yet. And Scott, don't let me upgrade to them yet. Um, I've already seen a few articles about some software we use. And I thought of this because the Intune team actually put out an article as well already that essentially says... Uh, Intune, mobile application management, that type of stuff is not supported on these beta versions of uh, iOS, iPadOS, and they will not declare support until it becomes generally available. They do test betas. They will try to find issues, um, but they already have put out there that Mobile application management isn't working correctly for Outlook Mobile and iOS 17 beta. Uh, the Max OS policy does not block Outlook Mobile on the beta release. Um, they did give a couple links to, to uh, GitHub for Android and stuff if you do find issues with the beta, if you want to be one of those brave souls testing this out. Um, but just a reminder for all of those people like us that are Apple people and maybe like to test betas and a reminder to myself um, to be careful with those. Uh, so it, it's actually a good call out. I don't know that it's just people like us anymore. So Apple has changed the, the 
I, I guess the kind of governance or rules for betas. So in in the past, especially for these early ones, you would have to be a member of the Apple Developer Program to be able to get access to them. And the Apple Developer Program was a paid thing. Like generally, you knew if you were doing it right, you were spending a hundred bucks a yep. year, and because you were spending a hundred bucks a year, you were going to have access to these things before they came out in public beta. So you had this dual release train of developer beta and public beta one being gated behind, uh, you know, spend a little bit of money. Uh, developer betas are ungated right now. <laughs> uh, so you do not need to be a paid developer anymore. So a lot of people, I think, freaked out when uh, 17 popped because it was showing up for everybody, including non-developers. Because uh, now if you go into like about software update, you know, you know general software update, uh, there's a, just a, a, a click uh, level menu that you can go into to say, show me the betas. Uh, and 17 is definitely in there for iOS, iPad, and Mac as well. Uh, so, you know, in that spirit of like, hey, tell your users not to do this kind of thing, like it might actually be more necessary than it has been in the past. And my understanding was that's going to be a standing change. Like it wasn't like, oh, somebody misconfigured something and it lit up and then it went away. It's like, no, the, 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 the terms of the developer program have changed where to get access to developer betas, you do not need to be a paid developer in the program anymore. Yes, I did see that because I saw the same thing that you said. Everybody freaked out. They're like, oh, Apple messed up. iOS 17 developer beta is out there for everyone. And I saw a correction to the article that said, no, you still, I guess you still have to be a registered developer, but you don't have to be a paid registered developer. So Cor Correct. But there's really like no gate there. Right? Like right. Any, anybody it's with like, an Apple ID can go, go sign up to be account. a developer. Yeah. You don't, you don't need like a, a, a DBA or a special number. There's no tax ID, anything like that uh, to, to get going with it. So it's, yep. and uh, I yeah. I suppose people on iOS, iOS is a much bigger ecosystem than Mac OS. Um, so there very well may be a lot of people with an iPhone that are thinking about upgrading just to try it out. Um, yeah, if you have an iPhone and all of a sudden you're excited that this is available, uh, be careful. And this also comes from experience with past betas. I have absolutely hosed stuff up before and wished I had not done the beta. Um, but now I have two machines, Scott, and I did update my iPad. I did go to the 17 beta on my iPad just to try it out. Um, because it is a non, my day-to-day -day work does not rely on that iPad working as it should. <laughs> your, your left hand knows not what your right hand does. Like yes. You open this with, don't let me do this to, I've already to, done I it. Already and that, did it. And well, that ship I have sailed. not done yeah. it on my, I, I have not done it on my phone <laughs> and I have not done it on my primary work computer, nor will I do it on either of those. Famous last words. It's on my test devices, Scott. Only test devices. <laughs> Ish. All right. Fair, fair, okay. fair enough. Um, another one, just a quick call out i saw this one too these are a couple of the ones that jumped out to me uh the exchange admin center or the classic exchange admin center in exchange online office 365 back in september of 2021 microsoft announced that this would be deprecated for our customers in the worldwide cloud in september of 2022 that time has obviously come and gone uh feature parity and all the other work is now officially complete so the classic exchange admin center will be deprecated in a worldwide environment on june 20th 2023 you have a grand total of 18 no eight days a week by the time this podcast comes out you'll have like two days um <laughs> and your classic exchange admin center will be gone you will be using Modern for everything. So if you have been relying on Classic Exchange Admin Center and knowing where everything is in there, uh, you might want to try out the Modern one and start learning where everything is in the Modern one because uh, stuff has shifted. Yeah, I thought there used to be a note in the docs that said it was going away, and I was I was just looking, pulling them up because you know they're still all out there. Like they don't have any notice on them <laughs> that it's going away right now, uh, which is. Kind of like, oh, yeah, you should probably 
have something there uh, that tells people to move along a little bit. Like I, I, I appreciate that all these teams put things into uh, places like tech community. Like that makes sense, uh, but th th they should really be in the official docs too. Like I run into more and more and more <laughs> people who don't even know tech community exists, which is kind of sad because there's some good stuff out there if, if you kind of know how to dig through it. But uh, yeah, like this stuff just needs to be in the docs. <laughs> I would agree, especially because I consider docs to be the official stuff. Like, because other people like tech community can be a wide range of people that have posted there. I would say, to your point, tech community isn't always 100% accurate because it's open to a lot of different people being able to post. Um, so docs being that official Microsoft documentation, approved documentation, all of that, um, it should absolutely always be in docs. Yeah, there's, there's stuff that isn't always appropriate for docs that can be augmented by tech community. So I, I've noticed what we're starting to do a little bit, and, and I've been trying this out myself, is putting out the kind of uh, the amount of detail that I can on the doc side and then linking out to tech community posts that are authored that maybe provide you okay. a little bit more prescriptive guidance, right? So like like one of the challenges is when you're doing these things is everybody's going to have a different situation. So, you know, quite often, like at least, I, and maybe it's more so on like the Azure side than the M365 side where it's a little bit more of kind of like a, a, a kind of boxed or, or on rails experience uh, is you're just giving people building blocks so you don't always want to tell them how to build the legos like sure you could build your optimus prime lego set but what if you really wanted to build you know one of your ferrari cars in the background like you could do that as well um so we try and avoid a lot of that in docs or at least i try to um but there are times i want to tell people like listen, you should be building Optimus Prime right now. Like Ferraris aren't where it's at for this thing, right? Like you need you you need a transformer. You don't need a, a single car to, to get done what you need to get done. Uh, so for stuff like that, I'll, I'll usually work with like our docs team and put like a link in that says, hey, for more information or, or for like more details on these scenarios, like boom, click out here. And then, you know, as I can get away with... Uh, <laughs> with the more prescriptive oh. guidance out in tech community or things like that, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely do it. Yes, and Sean in Discord just said, and by docs we obviously mean learn because that <laughs> rename was necessary. Yes, uh, learn.microsoft.com, yeah. not to be confused with docs.microsoft.com, or uh, I still talk about it as like docs.ms and just really screw people up. Which, because it was never like a real <laughs> docs that MS was never a real property, but it was a great way to shorthand it, at least in my head. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, it, oh. it, it's a thing. We, you can you can learn everything <clears throat> on learn. You you can you can both learn and get your documentation. Uh, should you want to go down that path? All on learn. Yes, I do miss that separation between docs and learn, but. All that aside, what else do you want to talk about today, Scott? What other interesting news do we have? Uh, so maybe a couple of uh, a couple more follow-ups from Build for some new things that came out that folks can uh, can take a look at. Um, so one that was kind of interesting to me is Azure Linux. Uh, is now a supported container host operating system for AKS. Uh, well, I guess it has been, but it's it's GA, right? It, it's it's kind of uh, ready to go and out there, and it's based on CPL Mariner. So. Um, I don't know if a lot of folks have heard of Mariner, uh, but Mariner is CBL Mariner. Uh, it's an internal Linux distribution that Microsoft built to kind of shape it to uh, Hyper-V, our, our hypervisors, uh, and, and even like kind of like the 
customish version of Hyper-V that runs inside of uh, Azure and, and things like that. Uh, so CBL Mariner is also what's behind things like Cloud Shell. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about Cloud Shell in the past to be able to spin that up. Like those are ultimately just uh, Mariner containers at this point. Uh, they use TDNF to do all the installs, private RPM repos, like, like all those uh, kinds of things. Um, so uh, CBL Mariner has been kicking around for a while now. It's open source out on GitHub. Like anybody can go uh, look at it. All the specs for it are out there, all those kinds of things. It even talks about how uh, RPM packages are built, how they come through. It's got uh, x86 ISO images. Like if somebody just wanted to spin it up in you know VMware or VirtualBox or, or something like that and <coughs> kick the tires really quickly. Um, but being a kind of Azure optimized version of Linux, like it, it's it's kind of uh, it's got all the things that a Linux kernel would need to run in Azure successfully. And really, that's about it without all the other like cruft on top of it. Uh, hence, okay. you've got like Cloud Shell that does all the additional installs and things. Um, so that's out and kicking around for AKS now, uh, GA. So when you spin up a new AKS cluster, you can say, I want to go with Azure Linux, which is this CBL Mariner thing under the hood. And you'll kind of have a... Microsoft first party optimized version of Linux as your container host OS. Uh, okay. So I, I thought that was a good one to see out and about and and kicking around. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the the more Microsoft leans into it, it's 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 an interesting one to watch. I think from the outside. Okay, because up until this time, did you have to use you had to use Ubuntu, right? That was the only Linux distro for AKS. Uh, I believe so, or where it, it was Ubuntu for a long time. Um, uh, but yeah, now, now Mariner's out and about. It's, it's well-baked and, and kind of ready to go. So um, yeah, I, I recommend folks uh, take a look at it. And I'll have some links in the show notes and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, for anybody here in the chat, we'll have some more as well. All right. Interesting. I I did not. I don't know that I ever realized Microsoft was even working on their own Azure Linux OS. Yeah, it's it's interesting to watch. So I, I think my first exposure to Mariner wasn't necessarily on the uh, AKS side of the house. I actually ran into it through Cloud Shell. So I was interested okay. in. Cloud Shell, you know, you just go into the portal, click a button, and boom, you get a Linux container. It's got PowerShell, yep. pre-bootstrapped, all, all that good stuff. It also has a bunch of other tooling bootstrapped into it. You know, it's got uh, AZ copy, and uh, it's got SQL command. It, it's It's got all the CLI installed for Azure. It's got PowerShell installed. Uh, and, 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 like, it's really just kind of, like, this nice, like, little tool in the toolbox, right, to, to get you moving forward. Uh, uh, if you're an Azure customer. So I, I went down the rabbit hole one day of thinking like, well, what if I want to run Cloud Shell locally? Like, you know, you can do the things in like VS Code where you can spin up Cloud Shell and connect to, you, you know, a version of Cloud Shell that's running up and instantiated in the portal. It's still running in the cloud. I was like, it's just a container. I should be able to run it locally. Um, so I wanted to go kind of go down the rabbit hole of seeing like, can I run it locally? Or if I can't run it locally, what are the other things that I can install along the way with it? And it turns out, yeah, it's just Mariner. Uh, uh, and Mariner can be spun up uh, super quick in, you know, a, a Docker file, Podman, like, uh, you, you know, however you want to get it up and running kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's it's a, a pretty nifty, uh, nifty little thing running around out there. Very cool. All right. Uh, oh, since we're what talking... Else do we have? containers uh let's talk one more about containers this will probably uh take us to time um so uh, if you're running containerized applications in the cloud uh, one of the things that you often run into is that you need some form of persistent and or persistent and shared storage across those containers. So that could be something like maybe you're standing up a 
uh, a sidecar for logging and you want, okay. you, you know, I'm, I'm running, I don't know, three pods with my application and I want all those logs to write to a central application. So bring them down, funnel them in, get them all into the same storage yep. place so that I can go look at them later from a single pane of glass kind of thing. So that might've been a need you had. Uh, you could also have a need just for, uh, spinning up and destroying volumes, like over the life of your pods. Sometimes you want them to be persistent. Like, okay, this pod is going to be up and running sometimes, but when it's not up and running, I still need uh, that volume to be around. Like, it can't be 100% ephemeral. Like, when my pod spins back up again, I kind of want it to maintain state and uh, get to where it needs to be. Um, so we've had a couple of things out there kicking around. We've had a CSI driver for storage for a while that you work with uh, both Blob and Azure Files. Uh, there there's a cozy uh, driver out there that's in beta uh, that will let you do things like more management plane operations, like, hey, let me spin up a container in a storage account or create a storage account itself, like, uh, as this pod spins up. Uh, but, like, they're kind of disconnected. One's management plane, one's data plane, and then you didn't get all the niceties that you needed or maybe access to all the things on the back end that you would want when it comes to block storage and getting backing storage into and, and exposed to a uh, to a set of pods uh, within you know a, a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so Azure Container Storage is out in preview now. Uh, this was announced uh, uh, back at build. And it's kind of all about bringing support for persistent volumes with, in, in your Kubernetes pods uh, with multiple types of backing storage. Uh, so you might have needs for, say, various IOPS IO on top of your containers, things like that. Uh, so with Azure Container Storage, you can have this backing storage mechanism. It can actually be one of three things. So uh, disks have been there for a while. And you could always do disks with maybe some limitations around what SKUs of disks were available. Uh, but now you can also do elastic SAN and you can do ephemeral disks and uh, spin those up. So you end up in this world now where you spin up your AKS cluster, you spin up a storage pool, which is going to be that collection of storage resources. They're, they're all grouped and presented as just this unified entity uh, over to your AKS cluster. And then they do all the heavy lifting for you, right? At that point, it's just exposing uh, persistent volumes back from that pool to your pods. And then Azure Container Storage as a service handles all the translation. So if it's got to talk to a disk, it knows how to talk to a disk. If it knows how, if it needs to talk like iSCSI to ElasticSAN, it knows how to do all that. Uh, basically, it handles like all the protocol translation stuff for you uh, so that you don't need to uh, you, you don't need to worry about that, right? Like if it's like NVMe versus iSCSI, like doesn't matter to you. All you're doing now is just saying like, hey, I'm mounting a persistent volume out of this pool and it's going to be up and ready to go for you rapidly. Nice. And it sounds like, I mean, especially with the Elastic SAM being there now, it provides some nice advantages in terms of scaling IOPS, scaling out of, I was just reading through the article here, scaling out for some of those stateful pods um, helps with some of the value management, but gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more options. It sounds like primarily from the scaling perspective when it comes to that storage. Yes. I, I think it's been a little bit of an issue, right? Like how, how do you consider... IOPS uh, at scale or a need to like rapidly burst IOPS across, you know, multiple pods on, on the same volume, things like that. Like it's hard, uh, you know, ultimately like a disk is a disk. So having right. more optionality there is good. Like something like ElasticSAN and, and its ability to uh, kind of have a base set of IOPS that's uh, you know, an order of magnitude higher than anything that you can get in a uh, a single disk, or at least a single disk that like us mere mortals want to pay for, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's nice to have, and it and it, it makes things just. 
uh, super accessible for everybody. So uh, I, I would recommend like folks, like if you're doing like CSI, things like that today, or you're just getting started with ACAST and you're like, huh, how can I get, uh, you know, better stateful management on the storage side out of this from like a first party lens? Like, you, you know, like I'm using Azure Kubernetes service, like what's the Azure storage thing that I would use? Uh, container storage is very likely one of the things that you would want to look at. Uh, I'll put a link to the docs in show notes for everybody out there. Uh, there's quick start guides, like how to uh, get everything uh, installed up and running. Um, you know, you've certainly got to get a cluster uh, up and going. Uh, you do have to install a uh, Kubernetes extension. So you'll, you'll be off on the command line uh, installing the uh, Microsoft Azure Container Storage extension. Uh, it is again a preview, so you know, you know certainly like uh, preview support, all those kinds of things. Uh, um, you know, they they apply. Uh, there's also a little bit of an FAQ uh, that's over on EL Docs. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, kind of walks through like what are the, some of the differences between uh, Azure Container Storage and the CSI driver, uh, regional availability, because it is a preview, it's it's potentially limited in region, um, how does billing work, things like that. Awesome. Thanks. Very cool. Always nice to get some of those more options. This is not a land I play in much. Scott, another one. You keep bringing up stuff that's not going on my list. This is not currently on my list of things to <laughs> dive into because I I would say of all the Azure services, AKS is probably one of the ones I'm still the least familiar with. Um, just does not apply to most of the work I do day to day. That's surprising. I play with containers all the time. I don't think I have. I still tend to do a lot of Microsoft 365 stuff, and containers don't tie in a lot to that. Um, and a lot of the Azure stuff is still a lot of VMs, networking, that type. Maybe I need to add containers and set aside like a few days to just really dive into containers. Oh, see? In my free time. It's back on the list. Back on the list <laughs> with containers as a whole. But we should probably wrap up. I have everybody bugging me. Coming back from vacation, everyone thinks I'm free right away Monday morning when I'm back from vacation. All right. Well, we'll let you get back to it. I see you're wearing your super dad shirt today. So, uh, I am, you know, de de deploy the superpowers. You'd be all set. Sounds good. I will see what I can do. And I will also try to sort through all my blog posts so we have even more good stuff to cover later this week when we record again. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. And we will talk to you later.